There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I'm here f with a glass of wine, ready to do my January wrap-up. And I have a earth-shattering, breaking news announcement to make. I've noticed as I've been editing and watching my videos in the last little while, when I have a physical book and I'm talking about it, I hold it up for about five seconds and then put it down and you never see it again. Whereas if I'm talking about a book that I did on audio or ebook, I put the GIF into the video, so it's up there like this for the whole duration. So I don't like holding a book up for Terry Long. It's not that the books are all that heavy, but it's just kind of a pain. Most booktubers do a better job of it than I do, but from now on, I'm not going to show any of my physical books. I'm just going to put the GIF up so you get to look at the gorgeous cover, hopefully it's a gorgeous cover, for the duration. The only time I'm going to show you a physical book is maybe on a book haul or, you know, there will be exceptions, but instead of just doing this for five seconds and then you have to look at my ugly mug for five minutes while I talk about the book, when it's a physical book, compared to having the benefit of the GIF up there for the duration in the other formats, I'm just going to see how this goes. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. I had a great reading month, especially considering all the bales. I have done a separate bale video, and I'm going to start with one more bale that I made at the very end of the month. And that was the audiobook of River of Teeth by Sarah Gailey. This is one that I found out about on Russell's channel, and I was crazy to try, but I'm crazy. I like to try new things occasionally because you never know, right? This was a <laughs> novel, a western novel, like the Wild Wild West, but with a crazy scenario that instead of cows and instead of horses I think it was in Louisiana I don't remember somewhere in the south uh, it was kind of a historical fantasy or something but Western and it was hippos and that was interesting at first but once the novelty of the fact that people were riding hippos around and eating hippo meat and there were no cows or horses to be seen once that wore off it was just and again I'm I say judgmental things because I hate genre fiction, so consider the source, but it just became a stupid western novel and I was bored to tears, so bailed. But for people that like genre fiction, it's really fun to try. And Russell loved it and other many other booktubers and litzy people have loved it and several people added it to their TBR from my bail review on Litzy, so great, but it wasn't for me. So that was my 12th bale of January 2018. I have a couple two-star reads here to tell you about. Both were disappointing. One because I love the author, and the other because I just thought it was going to be right up my alley. So the one that I love the author is Hilary Mantel's collection of short stories, The Assassination of Margaret Thatcher. And I really didn't like these short stories at all. They were deeply uninteresting. The writing wasn't interesting. I didn't care about any of this. the characters. I didn't find anything to be interested about. There was one story about a young girl, a girl with an eating disorder, that I had a faint murmur of visceral reaction to. That was it. The rest left me absolutely cold. And I love Hilary Mantel's Cromwell series, the first two, but these stories, I thought, were just a little bit higher than garbage. Two stars. The other one was... Uh, and I've talked about it a couple times already, it was Sarah Ladapo Manika's novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun. I love this little title so much when I heard Joss talk about it on Russell's channel, in fact. And it's about a 75-year-old Nigerian-American lady in San Francisco. And it just sounds, I mean, the title and the cover, look at the cover. It just, oh, this is a Sean book, but no, it wasn't very good. The lady sounded lovely, but I felt like I was reading her journal, and she wasn't much of a writer. I didn't really care. Then way too many characters were introduced, and that made it worse, and it was like a hundred-page novella, and it was just overcrowded. Not very interesting. I was disappointed. I, ho I think other people 
uh, as you know, other people in, in fact have commented on my channel that they liked it. So great, but no, it wasn't for me. So those are my two star reads, and I only had one three star read, which was a book of poetry by a Saskatchewan poet, Lorna Crozier. This is a kind of a collected works before the first word, the poetry of Lorna Crozier. And she is so famous in Saskatchewan and Western Canada. She was on staff at the University of Saskatchewan when I was a student there. I read one of her famous The Sex Lives of Vegetables poems on a Friday Reads a few weeks ago. You might want to look that up. Carrots are fucking the earth. Now that I'm 52 years old, that poem's the literary equivalent of a limerick written on a the men's washroom wall. Really, it's a little bit, it's got a little bit of something in it, aside from a chuckle. But the rest of these poems, you know, conveying stuff about her childhood and her husband and quitting smoking and stuff, but it felt like they were well-crafted prose pieces with arbitrary line breaks. I didn't think they were very good at all, so. I'm a man of the world now. I'm cosmopolitan. I don't know, still don't know anything about poetry, but I don't think Laura Crozier is much of a poet. Outside of her little milieu. So moving into happier territory, my four star reads, and I had a bunch. Let's see, the first one was a collection of short stories by Shoba Rao, an unrestored woman, and I really liked these stories. Most of them were about women on either side of the divide from the partition of India in 1947. Several of them were just heart-rending gems of stories about what these women experienced and how this partition divided their own bodies. I don't think any... I've never heard of another writer doing this, but each story was paired... So some of the same characters continued in the very next story, one, two, and then three, four, and then five, six. And that was really interesting. But by the end, I felt what prevented me from giving this five stars was that there were so many stories and so many characters that it, almost everything was terrible, awful, awful, that it started to feel like tragedy porn. And that was a feeling that came up for me only two or three times. It wasn't like a consistent feeling, but I just felt, like, if this had been a novel with fewer characters that we had followed, and maybe kind of a saga from 1947 to the present, that wouldn't have been my reaction a few times. So I still really like this collection. It's so strong. And it just makes me look all the more forward to her f debut novel, which is coming out maybe March. Another four-star read this month was Alina Bronsky's The Hottest Dishes of the Tartar Cuisine. I have a separate review on this that I just put up a couple days ago, so I'm not going to say much here, but it's a 2011 translation. I, li I like this book a lot because of the character. The main character is Rosa. She is nasty. She's a mother and a grandmother in Soviet-era Russia who is manipulative and deluded. She has delusions of grandeur and other delusions, and she's an egomaniac, and you can't help but not only be fascinated by her, but kind of root for her. She sucks you right in, so you're kind of second-guessing whether she might actually be a wonderful person and everybody else's shit. Like, it's really well done, the unreliable narrator thing, and it was funny, and I have much more to say about it on my review, so please check that out, but I quite enjoyed that. Another four-star read, and I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't end up being a five-star read because it, it's such a powerful collection of short stories. Dennis Johnson's posthumous collection that just came out in February, The Largesse of the Sea Maiden. And the first story, which is the title story, is one of the best short stories I've ever read. Most of these stories are about death and dying and coming to the end of life and illness and all of the things that Dennis Johnson was grappling with as he was writing them, presumably. And most of them are just incredibly powerful. And uh, I didn't know that this was the only other co collection of short stories that he wrote after his debut, Jesus' Son, which completely obliterated me when I read it last year. And I think I heard that in some of the reviews I read. What knocked a star off for me was I have to say that I hated the last story. It was about a man who was obsessed with Elvis's stillborn twin brother. And I find that fiction that talks about celebrities or real life historical personages usually leaves me cold and that story left me completely cold in a way that I was I was just hating it hate reading it at the end and that was kind of a disappointing way to end that collection but 
I also did it on audio, and sometimes the audio narration throws me off, so I am going to reread it textually, hopefully this year, and do a proper review once I've done that, because um, most of them were just incredible. My last four-star read of January was my first novel by Louise Erdrich, The Roundhouse, and I did this as part of Joss at Scribbles Reads Book Club, and I had been wanting to read a Louise Erdrich novel forever. took advantage of the fact that I could do this and take part in her book club, so that was great. I enjoyed this novel. It reminded me in some ways of the Canadian novel that I read just a little bit over a year ago called The Break by Katharina Vermet, which was a novel about sexual assault in an indigenous Canadian community in Canada. And this was a similar story in a American reservation. Really well-drawn characters. The mother is raped at the very beginning, and she's an, not a young woman. The protagonist is a 12-year-old boy, and uh, his parents were quite old when they had him. She was raped, and it's a big mystery, and she's traumatized, and she won't talk about what she knows, what she remembers of the attack, and she locks her, kind of locks herself in the bedroom for weeks, and his dad is a judge on the reservation. The story's really well told for the most part, and it was kind of a mystery, but not too much of a mystery where my mystery genre hate buttons got pushed. I found it emotionally compelling, and I uh, kept turning the pages, but I have to say Louise Erdrich in many ways is not a great writer. Her prose is very uneven. I felt. So, well, some of the writing sang, a lot of it just f clattered <laughs> to the floor. Really awkward phrasing. She's a very undisciplined writer, and there's a, there was an unruliness to it. And some people who like her stuff, who like her writing, ad admit that. I'm no, This is the only novel I've read by her, but I can see that Part of what I loved about the novel comes from that tumultuous, exuberant, undisciplined way that she tells a story. So, four stars, and I will definitely read more by her, but yeah, it, it was a bit of a mess, but an interesting one. And a powerful one. Alright, I think those are my four stars, so I have three five-star reads to tell you about. And the first one is a book of poetry that by the time I'd read the third poem I had realized that I had discovered my new favorite poet. His name is Ocean Vuong. He is a gay Vietnamese American poet and he's about 27 or 30. And this is his debut collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds. Maybe from 2016? I'm not sure, but it won the T.S. Eliot Prize just a couple weeks ago. I don't know how to talk about poetry, but I have promised myself that I'm going to reread it soon and do my best to do a full in t a full review because I I'm getting to enjoy, I'm starting to enjoy poetry more and more so I want to develop a, a language to actually talk about why but today I'm just going to read you one of my favorite poems it is called Queen Under the Hill I approach a field a black piano waits at its center I kneel to play what I can a single key a tooth tossed down a well, my fingers sliding the slimy gums, slit lips, snout, not a piano, but a mare draped in a black sheet, white mouth sticking out like a fist. I kneel at my beast, the sheet sunken at her ribs, a dented piano where rain collected from the night reflects a blue sky fallen into the side of a horse blue thumbprint pressed from above, as if something needed to be snuffed out, leaving this black blossom dropped on a field where I am only a visitor, a word exiled from the prayer, flickering. Wind streaks the pale grass flat around us, the horse and I a watercolor hung too soon and dripping. Green waves surround this black rock where I sit turning bones to sonatas, Fingers blurred, I play what I know, from listening to orchards unleash their sweetest wrongs. The dent in this horse wide enough to live by, puddle of sky on earth, as if to look down on the dead is to look up at my own face, trampled by music. If I lift the sheet, I will reveal the heart huge as a stillbirth. If I lift the sheet, I will sleep beside her as a four-legged shadow, 
hoof homed to hoof. If I close my eyes, I'm inside the piano again, and only. If I close my eyes, no one can hurt me. Ocean Wong, ladies and gentlemen. Whew, I need a cigarette. Don't smoke anymore. What should I do? I mentioned on Friday Reads that I have now been accepted to review a few books through NetGalley, and so the first one, it's going to be published in about 10 days, so I will make a full review and post it on pu its publication date, is from Archipelago Books and translated from the Norwegian. I will put the translator down here because I definitely don't have that information at my fingertips, but it's called Love by Hane Orstavik, and I loved it. So I'm so happy. It's my first NetGalley review, and I can authentically give a glowing review because I loved it. It's about a single mom who moves to a new small town in Norway with her soon-to-be nine-year-old son. The next day is his birthday, and that's a big part of what little plot there is here. The writing or translation is just beautiful. They are like two ships passing in the night. They are sometimes in the house together, but the mother is... I don't know if I would say she's completely self-absorbed, but she's pretty darn self-absorbed and only vaguely aware of her son. Meanwhile, he's keyed up because tomorrow's his birthday, but they don't really communicate very much, and the narrative flips from her consciousness to his, and I don't know how the final book will be typeset, but in the galley, it was really hard to tell when it would flip, and that was fascinating because there's always a strong resonance, even at the sentence level, even at the word level, between where one consciousness is ending and the other's beginning, and that was rich for me. There's a lot of suspense in this novel. We wonder if harm is going to come to this kid, because he kind of wanders out, and she doesn't even know he's gone, and then she goes off and thinks her son's at home, and, and they both end up on adventures with new people in the new town, and how dangerous are these people? is part of what's going on in the plot, but it's told with such wonderful writing. And then the other theme is the neglect, you know, because she just, she doesn't remember it's her son's birthday tomorrow. It's a short little novel, and I loved it. So stay tuned for my full review in about a week or so. And the last of my five star reads is a novel from 2016 called After the Parade by Lori Ostland. I just put a full review up earlier today. I'm quite pleased with how it turned out. I'm not going to say much here. The uh, main character is a late 30-something gay male American guy who leaves his lover after something like 20 years and up and moves to San Francisco. He was an abused child in many ways and had kind of shut down all of that until he starts his new life in San Francisco and the memories come back. The, the prose just flows like water. There's a lot of quirky people, characters that come into Aaron's life and he is such a loving, receptive guy that he gives them space to tell their stories in this novel and it's uh, quietly powerful. So please check out my review. So that is my January wrap-up. Even though it was kind of a DNF massacre of a month, I had a great month, so thanks for watching.